Well, this morning, we are going to be looking at Genesis chapter 18. And if you asked a Jewish person or someone that spent a lot of time reading the Old Testament what this chapter was about, they would tell you with very little hesitation, Genesis chapter 18 is all about hospitality and having a heart for other people. Now, the last couple of weeks have been kind of rough on Abraham. Um, Abraham has shown over and over again that he is not a perfect man, but that he is a willing man to be used of God. And as we've said in here every single week, God is not looking for perfect people because only one exists. God is looking for willing people, people who are willing to be used of God and have faith that God will do what he says he is going to do. So this morning, we are finally past um, Abraham's rough patch, and we are going to start looking at the heart of this man, the reason why God chose him to be the father of the nation of Israel, and ultimately the father of um, the Messiah who would come in Jesus 2,000 years later. Abraham cared about people. And it's going to become very evident this morning as we go through this chapter. So if you would, if you brought your Bibles, open them up to Genesis chapter 18. We're going to start with verse 1. It says, And the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick! Three say as a fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and brought it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. All right, hospitality. Hospitality is the heart of God toward other people. Hospitality is putting other people ahead of ourselves caring more about others than we care about ourselves. And Abraham understood this quality, and he had this quality. So the first thing that we see here is that the Lord appeared to him. Now, this word Lord is an important word, and um, in your Bible, it's probably all capitalized. If you have If you have a good translation, this first time you see the word Lord, it will be all capital letters. And and these capital letters actually refer to the name of God, Jehovah. And it's capitalized because it's letting us know that the Lord that it's talking about here is actually God himself. It could be the angel of the Lord. Many understand this to be the pre-incarnate Jesus. This is my personal belief that this is actually Jesus before he was on earth um, because we know he existed. And he's actually walking in, in human semblance um, so that he can appear to Abraham. So God comes to him. Now, Abraham has no idea that this is God. Abraham just sees this as a normal guy with, with two traveling companions. It's the hot part of the day. You see, in Bedouin culture, during the hottest part of the day, in, in this part of the world, it can get upwards of 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a very, very hot time. You don't want to be out in the sun. This is the worst time of day to be out traveling. It's definitely the worst time of day to receive guests to your home because you don't want to be moving around when it's hot. You want to be sitting in the doorway of your tent where it's shady and you can get a breeze and you can relax. Well, God doesn't care about what's convenient. You ever notice that? You ever notice that God doesn't really care about our comfort? Kingdom living is not about comfort and convenience. Kingdom living is about willingness. So God shows up in the hot part of the day, the most difficult part of the day, because this is often what he does. God will often show up when things are going hard for you or when you're not comfortable or when things are not easy. And you know why God shows up then? Because if he showed up when things are easy, you would probably not rely on him. He shows up when things are hot and difficult because that's when we're going to call upon him and we're going to rely upon his strength instead of our own. So God shows up. He doesn't know it's God, just a normal guy. And what does it say he does? It says he lifts up his eyes, he sees them, and he takes off running. 
In the hottest part of the day, Abraham takes off running to these guests because he understands that it's the hot part of the day and they don't need to be out traveling when the sun is directly overhead because you can get heat stroke. It's just not a good thing. He cares more about their condition than he does about his own comfort. This is the first part of hospitality, caring more about someone else's comfort than you do your own. So he runs to them and he humbles himself and he says to them, O Lord. Now, when he calls him Lord, and these are not, it's capital L because it's a, it's a name or a reference, but it's not all capitals. So he's just using this as a term, um, a terminology of respect. He was calling him Lord or, or master. And he says, oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass me by, but let me bring you something for your refreshment. See, this is hospitality. This is the heart of what we do to serve other people. We bring them in, we go to them. We don't wait for them to come to us. We go to them and we offer ourselves, we offer what we have to them so that they can be comforted and so that they can have enjoyment. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, Do not do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but rather in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And let each one of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is the core. This is the foundation of being hospitable toward others. So he says, go ahead and do this. So what's Abraham do? He runs to his wife, Sarah. Now, you're going to see the word quickly and run over and over and over again because he doesn't just take his time. He doesn't, you know, he's not frustrated. He's not bored. He's not doing this um, unwillingly. He has this willing, ser- this willing servant's heart. So he takes off and he tells Sarah, all right, I need you to prepare some bread. Then he runs over to the herd and I want you to see what he gets. He doesn't say, hey, can you just find whatever's laying around? Hey, can you find what was left over from last week? Hey, can you just, can you get that dying calf, the one that nobody wants and kill it and all, and I'm going to prepare, prepare that for these people? No, he goes and finds the best. Because a heart of hospitality, you offer the best that you have to other people. You offer the best of yourself to other people, not from an unwilling place, but from a heart to serve, from a heart of love and grace and mercy. Abraham offers the best that he has, and then he takes it to them, and he offers it, and he stands by while they eat. Now, the reason that he didn't sit down with them is because he wanted to stand there in case they needed anything else. He was waiting to serve their needs. Now, we know that it was God. So we know that it's a good thing that Abraham had this heart, because can you imagine if God would have shown up, and Abraham would have been like, man... It is 1 o'clock, it is 117 degrees out here, and I just sat down, and the the breeze just started blowing. I just, I'm just not feeling it. You guys ever have a, I'm just not feeling it moment? You're just like, you know, I really should go to church this morning, but I'm really just not feeling it. I haven't read my Bible in three months, but I'm just not feeling it. I know I should probably pray right now, but I'm just really not feeling it. I know I probably should be kind to that person that just flipped me off, but I'm just really not feeling it, right? Don't you think Abraham was glad that he didn't rely on how he was feeling in that moment? Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some people have entertained angels unaware. This is what this verse is talking about. This is a pretty serious verse. We should not take hospitality lightly because you never know when it's an opportunity for God to show up in a big way in your life. When we, oper- when we operate in our lives out of a place of love and service and taking care of other people, it overrides our selfishness. 1 John 4, 7-8 through 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So let me give you a little bit of a litmus test here this morning. If you're not in a place yet, and I'm going to use the word yet, where you have a desire just naturally springing up within you to serve and take care of other people, then Jesus has some room for you to grow yet. If you say, you know what, I just really don't care about other people. In fact, I just really don't want to be around other people. And if they mind their own business, then I'll mind my own business and we'll just go on, right? Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't. 
The Bible says that we take care of other people. The Bible actually says that if you know God, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you will naturally just begin to want to serve other people because love will not be able to help itself but bubble up out of you. Your life will become a life of love and caring and service for other people. You may be the most selfish jerk on the planet, and if Jesus comes into your life, you won't be able to help yourself but serve. Because I can tell you this. 17 years ago, I could have cared less about anybody else. The only time I served someone else was to manipulate them into giving me something in return. But when Jesus came in and he began to transform my heart and renew my mind, I began to see people in a different way. I no longer saw them as tools to be used for my own benefit. I began to see people as objects to be loved by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. You see, I'm not loving because I have to. I'm loving because I've already received love. I'm not loving out of my own strength and my own ability. I'm loving out of a reservoir of love that Jesus Christ has already poured into me. Jesus has already served me and continues to serve me more than I could ever serve another person. So when I serve others, I've got this natural, amazing reservoir to tap into right here. The problem is, is if you don't have that reservoir, you can't serve people long term with good attitude. You'll begin to become resentful. You'll begin to become frustrated. You'll begin to become confused. Your attitude toward people will change. And I can and I can tell you this. I, I bet Pastor Linda could probably agree with this. I mean, she deals with people every single day that come in needing something. Have you ever had people just need something from you all day long, every day? Any any moms in here? Any moms in here that when your husband came home from work one day, your head was spinning around and he's like, hey, babe, can you? And you're like, don't, <laughs> don't ask anything. <laughs> I've had kids hanging off me all day. I've gotten 74 juice boxes today. I'm not going to do one more thing for you. All right. Why? Because it drains us. When we have people wanting something from us all the time, it drains us. At Heart of Hope, people come in all the time needing and wanting. And if Pastor Linda did not keep her relationship with Jesus close and solid, she would run out of that reservoir and all of a sudden her attitude would change. But if you've ever dealt with that amazing godly woman for five minutes, you've only ever received love from her. And it's because she has that close relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to tell you, yes, give her a hand. I love this lady. If you're a jerk, it's your fault. Okay? It's because you don't have that reservoir of love. And you know what? It's there. It's available to you. God wants to pour his love into you so that you can pour it into other people. Moving on, it says, They said to Abraham, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, Well, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, and they were advanced in years. He's 100, she's 90, okay? We've used this reference before. This, this would be like Betty White having a baby. So Sarah laughs to herself, saying, after I'm worn out, and my Lord is old, now will I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child, now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, because she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. So now this man reveals who he truly is to Abraham. He's no longer just a man. Now he reveals himself to be God because of this supernatural knowledge and understanding and prophetic promise that he has to offer. And he says to Abraham, okay, where's Sarah? And he doesn't say it in a quiet voice like, hey, where's Sarah? He says, where's Sarah? Why does he do it this way? Because he wants to get her attention. He knows that she's listening. He wants her to hear what he's about to say. And he says, at this time next year, I'm going to show up and you're going to have a baby. And Sarah is standing behind the tent flap to where she can't be seen, but she's listening in because this is what she does. And she starts to laugh to herself. <laughs> am I now going to have a kid? You're telling me I am way past baby having age 
I mean, I should be a great, great, great grandmother by this time. And now you're telling me I'm going to have a baby. Can any of you ladies in here over the age of 60 imagine Jesus saying you're going to be pregnant? No, no. Now imagine being 90 and Jesus saying, guess what? You're going to have a baby. I haven't had one yet, right? And Abraham's 10 years older than her. He's old, right? So she laughs to herself and God says, why is Sarah laughing? Why is she laughing? Isn't this kind of a natural response though? How many times have you heard something in a sermon or have you read something in the Bible and you went, man, that's for them, but it's definitely not for me. I'm glad that works for everybody else. Oh, the blessings of the Lord. Yeah, I see everybody else getting their blessing, but I never get blessed. Any of you guys ever say stuff like that? We all do, right? We all make these complaints. This is why the Bible says it's so important for us to guard our hearts and take every thought captive. Because this type of thought, this type of attitude can change, can change your entire life. If she would have continued on in this thinking, who knows what would have happened to the promises of God in her life. But God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Can you think of anything? I mean, honestly, with what you know about God, what you know about Jesus Christ, the creator of heaven and earth, split the Red Sea, raised from the dead. Is there anything that you can imagine that you can think of off the top of your head that is too hard for God to do? Anything, can you? Of course not. Because God can do anything. So if God can do anything, is something like this too hard for God? Is it unusual? Yes. Is it too difficult? No. We react to unusual in the wrong way. Instead of saying, praise God, how cool is this going to be? This is going to freak some people out. We say, no, this can't happen. It's never happened before. Never be happened before is God's specialty. Especially in your life. Because you might say, well, I've never made a good decision like that. I've never been in a good relationship before. I've never been physically healthy before. I've never had a good relationship with my kids before. I've never had a good job before. Guess what? There is nothing too difficult for God. Your problems are nothing compared to what God can do. But she's really just feeling insecure, right? Because her focus isn't on what God can do. Her focus is on what she can't do. And this is what gets us off track so much, is we're not thinking about what God is able to do. We're thinking about what we're not able to do. We're thinking about our limitations. She says, I'm worn out. I am old. I am, I am like menopause this round two, right? I mean, she has just been around for a while. But what's the word of God say? Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. What happens when you're tired and you're worn out and you're spent? You wait upon the Lord. You don't try to pull that from your own reserves, from your own strength, from your own ability. You wait upon the Lord and you trust in Jesus. You spend time with Jesus and he will strengthen you. He will give you the energy. He will give you the ability. He will give you even the love to follow through with what he has promised you. So Genesis 18, 16 says, Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward the city of Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very serious or grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether all these things according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know it. So Abraham walks with them. He he sees them on their way out from his area and and they're headed down to the the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now at this time, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were a lush, fertile, very, very green area. Now this area just to the west uh, or just to the east of the Dead Sea is one of the most barren deserts on the face of the earth. Last month, I had the ability to drive through this part 
of Israel going down to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is dead because God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The Dead Sea is dead because after God destroyed these cities, the water ran through that area and all of the stuff that was left over washed down into the sea and completely killed it and made it stagnant so that no life can live in it. But at this time, this was still a strong, rich, fertile place. So they're on their way down and God says, shall I hide for Abraham what I'm about to do? No, you know what, that doesn't make any sense because Abraham, you are the father of the people of Israel and the, na- the whole world's going to be blessed by you. So I'm not going to hide from you what I'm about to do. You know what? God hasn't hidden from us what he's about to do. We have the same calling as, it, as Abraham. We have the same blessing that Abraham did. And God hasn't, revealed, hasn't hidden from us what he's about to do. What does the Bible say is about to happen in this world? All hell's going to break loose, right? There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be chaos. People are going to turn on each other. Evil is going to run rampant. There's going to be earthquakes and tsunamis and hurricanes. And people are just going to become more and more and more evil. Do we see any of that beginning? Yeah, right? It's not hidden from us. You know why it's not hidden from us? Because God intends for us to be a blessing. He tells Abraham, I'm not going to hide from you because you are the inheritor. You are the bringer of blessing. Guess what? You have that same calling. You are meant to be the bringer of blessing. How do you bring blessing? By bringing Jesus Christ. You bring God's kingdom with you everywhere you go. If you are part of the kingdom, it's inside of you. And everywhere you go, every place you step, you bring God's kingdom. I don't care if you're going into a dorm room. I don't care if you're going into an office. I don't care if you're going into a classroom. Everywhere you go, you are bringing God's kingdom. And you should be the bringer of blessing. But that blessing comes through the message of Jesus Christ. Through the love and goodness Of Jesus Christ. So the men turned from there. And they went down to Sodom. This is this is verse 22. It says, but Abraham stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous people in the city. Will you sweep them away and and sweep away the place and not spare it for 50 righteous people who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. You see, God had told Abraham, I'm going to go there and I'm going to destroy it. In fact, he said, I've been hearing all these cries from the innocent people that have been destroyed in this place because Sodom and Gomorrah were just a a playground of wickedness. It was a place that any type of thing you can imagine was going on culturally. They were just they were just becoming increasingly, increasingly wicked and removed from the things of God. God says, because of this, because so many innocent people are suffering, I'm going to go and destroy them. In fact, I'm going to show up in person. You see, this isn't because God isn't a God of all knowledge. It's not because God doesn't see all things and know all things and hear all things. It's because God is a God of closeness. And when things become difficult, God draws closer and closer and closer. God is never far away. God is always near. So he says, I'm going to go near to the problem. And Abraham says, but God, what if? What if there are righteous people there? What if there's only 50 righteous people? Are you going to destroy them too? Are you going to kill them too? Why does Abraham care? Abraham cares because his nephew Lot's there. He's got family there. He's got friends there. And he knows that they, they know the Lord, that they, that they serve God. Abraham is invested in this community. Abraham deeply cares for this community. Are you invested in your community? Are you invested in the lives of people, even strangers? Do you care about the people that you come into contact with? Do you care about the people living around you? Do you genuinely care about the city, the community that you live in? Are you invested in them? 1 Timothy 2.4 says, 
God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Is that my desire? Do I really desire all people to be saved? Do I really desire all people to come to the truth? Because in their definition of righteousness at this time was that they were living for God. You know what the definition of righteousness is now? Knowing Jesus Christ. The definition of righteousness that we live out every single day is knowing Jesus Christ, is putting our hope and faith in Jesus. Do I really desire all people to be saved? Do I really care whether or not my city is going to be destroyed or am I okay keeping my distance from it? You know, I'm, I'm one of those who theologically lean toward believing in a pre-tribulation rapture. So that means, you know what that means? Rapture theology says that if I believe in Jesus and he comes back, I won't be here during the great tribulation. Now, a lot of people argue that. I think there's good arguments for, for both sides of that, but I lean toward the rapture. I think that there's a lot of evidence that points toward the rapture in the Bible. But you know what that means? I'm not going to be here when all the bad stuff breaks out. So I'm just going to chill, right? I'm just going to live my life. I'm just going to go home every day. I'm going to watch some TV. I'm going to hang out with my girls. I'm going to spend time with my wife. And I'm just not going to worry about everybody else because I'm not going to be hurt by it. Abraham could have said that. Abraham could have said, I'm not going to be there. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't matter to me. It's not going to affect me. Let them, let them sinners burn. But he was invested. He was invested. You know what a heart of hospitality does? A heart of hospitality gives you a love for other people. Now that word, that beginning of that word, H-O-S-P, hosp, we find it in other words too. Hospital and hospice. That H-O-S-P means caring for other people. That hosp, it means to care for others. But the care that you receive in a hospital is very different from the care that you receive in hospice, isn't it? Why do you go to hospice? To be made comfortable so you can die and peace. That's what a lot of churches are. A lot of churches provide great hospice care. Come on in, we'll get you saved, and then you can just relax comfortably until you die. What's a hospital do? A hospital has completely different expectations. You go into a hospital expecting to be made better, expecting to be healed, expecting that you're going to walk out of there better than what you came in, right? Otherwise, why go to the hospital? It's very, very, very expensive to walk into the hospital if the, nothing good is going to happen. You might as well just go to hospice care. And so many of us buy into hospice more than we do hospital. But we are meant to be a hospital. We're meant to be a place where people can come in and be transformed and changed and made better. We are a spiritual hospital. We have this heart of hospitality that we care for people, but we care for people so much that we won't leave them the way that they came in. If all we do at our food pantry is hand out food, then we do not have hospitality. But if we sit down with these families and we invite them in and we walk with them and we love them and we encourage them so that they can change by the power of Jesus, then we're loving them. And you know what? This morning we have several families here from our, from our um, community kitchen and food pantry. Give them a hand this morning. We love having you here. We love having you here. But the point of outreach is not doing nice things. The point of outreach is bringing people to the truth of Jesus Christ, which is the greatest thing. Abraham continued and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose... Five and fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And God said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. And again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, okay, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, okay, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, okay, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And the Lord answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. Then the Lord went on his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. What's Abraham's heart here? God, what if 50? But what about 45? But what about, but what about 40? But what about 30? But, but what about 20? But what about 10? What about one? What if God would call you to hospitality to see one person come to Jesus? 
What if God would use you to see one person come out of a destructive life and into the life that God intended them? What if God would give you the opportunity to see one person person saved are you willing to get up from where you're sitting comfortably and do something even when it's difficult for the sake of one person for the sake of one many of us aren't there and the reason for that is because sometimes it's hard to get excited about strangers and we ask the lord jesus Who exactly would you call me to go after? Jesus, who exactly are you calling me to serve? Jesus, who exactly am I called to show this kind of hospitality? And Jesus answers very clearly in Luke 10. In Luke 10, 29, it says, But this man came desiring to justify himself, and he said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, Let me tell you a story. There was a man going down from Jerusalem to the city of Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, who was a worker of the temple, when he came to the place, saw the man and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was an enemy of the people of Israel, they considered them half-breed, know-nothing, good-for-nothing people, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, Well, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Sometimes it's a stranger. Sometimes it's an enemy. It's everybody. The priest, the pastor, the elder, the deacon of the church, he saw the man in need and he said, man, this doesn't really fit my schedule right now. I'll just say a prayer. Lord, help him in Jesus' name. All right, going on. Then the, then the church attender came by, the guy that's always at church, the guy who knows how to speak the Christian language, but doesn't really know how to live it, comes by and he's like, oh man, that's, that's really bad for that guy falling down. I should, you know what we should do? We should make a law that makes it illegal to hurt people and leave them by the side of the road. That's what, that's what we'll do. We'll, 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 play, we'll pass some legislature for that. And he goes on about his business. But then an enemy, a stranger comes up and he sees this man broken and in need. And he puts him on his own animal. And he uses his own resources. He takes his own time and his own energy to care for this man. Who he has no guarantee will ever pay him back. Or will even appreciate what he's doing for him. But he does it because it's the right thing to do. He has a spirit of hospitality. And Jesus points to the Samaritan. To the enemy. To the stranger. And he says you go and be like that guy. Don't be like the religious people who know how to talk it, but don't ever walk it. Don't just be hearers of the word of God. Actually do something with it and put it into action. Acts 26, 16. There's a movie out right now called Paul, Apostle of Christ. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. It's, it's not perfect, but it's, just, it's a great movie. If you know anything about Paul, Paul was a, was a horrific murderer. He hated Christians. And he thought he was serving God by killing Christians. And then one day God showed up to Paul, this enemy of Christ, this this man who hated Jesus and all of his followers. And Jesus shows up to him and he says to him in verse 16, I want you to rise and stand upon your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and in those in which I will appear to you. Delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. What is God's heart toward people? That their eyes would be opened that their hearts would be changed, that they would come to the knowledge of Christ. Romans 10.1 says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for unbelievers is that they might be saved. What's your heart? 
Are you willing to intercede for the people around you? Are you interceding for your family? Are you interceding for your friends, for your children, for your spouse? Are you interceding? Are you desperately crying out to God, save them, save them, forgive them, heal them, turn them around? Luke 5.31 says, and Jesus answered them, "Um, yeah, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance it's easy to love the lovable do we have a heart of hospitality to love those that nobody else will love those who don't act like everybody else those don't who smell like everybody else those who don't understand like everybody else do we have a heart to love other people and romans 10 14 finishes it off how then will those type of people call upon Jesus in whom they have not believed. But how are they to believe in Jesus of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching or someone telling them? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The world needs Jesus. Anybody in here disagree with that? I mean, when you watch the five o'clock news and you see death and destruction and racism and injustice and brokenness and, and all the garbage that's going on in politics and you see all the immorality and everybody arguing with each other, do you ever think to yourself, man, that's that's exactly the way that it should be? No, we think to ourselves, dear God, they need you. But you know how they're going to get him? Through you. The world is only going to be changed through you. Your neighborhood, your family, your friends, your coworkers, the world around you will only change if you respond to it with a heart of hospitality. If you say, I'm willing to get up from my comfort place and do something even when it's hard, even when it's inconvenient, even when it's not easy. I'm willing to show the love of Jesus. That's the only way anything's going to change. Let's pray. Right now is our time to respond to the Lord. The Lord is calling us to a lot more than just standing by and watching things happen. You see, what we learn from this story is that God is not a God who stands off and just listens to people's cry and does nothing about it. God is a God who comes near, who comes close. You know how close God wants to get to the situations around you? God wants to come extremely close because he wants to come through you and come right up next to these people. He wants to take you into into dark places to bring light. He wants to take you into brokenness to bring healing. He wants to take you into lostness so that people can be found. Jesus wants to use your life and your love and your hospitality to change the world around you. This is why Abraham was chosen. Because even though he was flawed, even though he made mistakes, even though he did stupid things and got in his own way, he had a heart of hospitality and he had a heart to serve others and he was willing to intercede for those that nobody else would care about. But Jesus just doesn't come for those who are saved. Remember he says it's not those who are righteous, but it's those who are sick. And this morning, if you're sitting here and you're like, you know what, Pastor Tanner, I, I resemble the sick and the broken much way more than I do the righteous and the, the guy, that, the person that has it all together. And you'd say, I, I really need Jesus. I'm, I'm one of those who needs Jesus. Would you just be honest and raise your hand this morning? Say, I, I need, I'm one of those that needs Jesus. I'm just going to pray. And if that's the desire of your heart, 
to be in relationship with Jesus, I'm just going to invite you to pray. A prayer of invitation for God to come in and change your life. Just make these words your own. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. I've made a mess of things, but I need you to fix it. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe you rose from the dead, and I put my hope and trust in you and not myself. I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord, and I ask you to take control. My life is yours. Give me your heart and use me for your glory. In Jesus' name.